Clark declined to talk to Frontline, but he did talk to journalist Samantha Power. And they end up in a screaming match. The fight is not about whether to send U.S. troops to Rwanda. That's not even contemplated. The fight is simply about how to withdraw the U.N. peacekeepers and how many to withdraw and how many to leave in place and what the function of those peacekeepers should be who remain in place. That's what the fight is about. That's the extent of the dissent at the highest level of the U.S. government about this genocide. That's it. That phone call. With the United States demanding a withdrawal, the UN instructed General Dallaire to start closing down his peacekeeping mission. Dallaire turned to his deputy, General Henry Aniadojo, for advice. And I remember sitting in front of his desk, huge man sitting there, stoic. And I said, uh, Henry, they want us out. We failed in the mission. We failed in attempting to convince. We failed the Rwandans. We are going to uh, uh, run uh, and cut the losses. That's what they want us to do. And I said, no, we haven't failed. And as commanders, we are going to sit here, uh, sit here work hard, and see to each solution. So let's tell the, those people back in New York that we do not think that the mission should be closed. Aniadojo assured Dallaire his Ghanaian peacekeepers would stay. And that was all I needed. That meant that I would still have troops on the ground, which were good troops, not well equipped, but good troops. So I stood up and I said, Henry, we're not going to run. We're not going to abandon the mission. And we will not be held in history uh, of being accountable for the abandonment of the Rwandan people. It was just morally corrupt to do that. And that's when I went back and told him to go to hell. As the UN debated whether to keep a peacekeeping force in Kigali, the extremist Hutu leadership implemented the next phase of its plan, to spread the killing across the nation by exploiting Rwanda's culture of obedience. They told Hutus the Tutsi rebels were foreign invaders bent on turning them into slaves. Their propaganda reminded Hutus that the Tutsis had ruled them for centuries, often treating them with disdain. Tutsis used to abuse Hutus. For example, if a Tutsi chief wished to stand up from his chair, he would call up a Hutu, who would allow his foot to be pierced by the Tutsi's spear as he stood up. My understanding is that Tutsis are not originally from Rwanda. I heard that they might have come from Egypt or somewhere else. An extremist hate radio station told Hutus to eliminate their Tutsi neighbors. Then, when the war began, people changed. One day across the valley, we saw houses burning, some people fleeing from their homes. A 12-year-old girl named Valentina followed her parents into the Catholic church in near Abuye, where along with more than 5,000 other Tutsis, they waited. It was April the 15th. I was a young girl. My parents thought the church was safe because no one will be killed in a church. When we arrived, I could see the older people were very sad and upset. Everybody was scared, but nobody knew what was going to happen. 
responsible know what to give the leader of the local community told us that Tutsis had fled to Nyarubuye and that we were to go there and kill them. On the morning of April 15th, we woke up and started walking towards the church. It was like going to the marketplace. I saw the soldiers come in and they started shooting and shooting. All we had to defend ourselves were rocks. Then our local governor, Gachumbitsi, came in and stood in front of us. Gachumbitsi said that everyone should know what they were there for. He said that all those who were there should be killed, that no one should survive. Then they started killing, hacking with their machetes. They kept doing it, and I was hiding under dead people. They didn't kill me because of the blood covering me. They thought they had killed me. It was as if we were taken over by Satan. When Satan is using you, you lose your mind. We were not ourselves. You couldn't be normal and you start butchering people for no reason. We had been attacked by the devil. It was very late. It was very late, around 2 a.m. when the Inhera Humwe came back. One of them stepped on my head. He was shaking me with his foot to see if I was alive. He said, this thing is dead, and so they left. I lived among the dead for a long time. At night, the dogs would come to eat the bodies. Once the dog was eating someone next to me, I threw something at the dog and he ran away. I hid in a small room. That's where I stayed and slept for 43 days. As the Kutsi rebel army pushed south towards the capital, they found evidence of massacres in village after village. With the rebels approaching, extremist Hutus unleashed more in Terahamwe militias to accelerate the killing. The murdered prime minister had been replaced by Jean Kambanda, who incited followers to repulse the Tutsi rebels and their sympathizers, known as Inkotanyi. The Inkotanyi did not come to conquer power only. They are after you too. They want to kill you all. Guns are not only for soldiers. Every person can own a gun. If they shoot, you shoot back. I too carry one all the time. Here it is. Extremist Hutus referred to Tutsi survivors as those not finished off. The Red Cross had never left Rwanda, and those who stayed confronted a stark moral dilemma. What do you do in the face of evil?
A BBC reporter spoke to the Red Cross leader in Rwanda, Philippe Gaillard. Walking around here, it, 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 the images are quite horrific. You've been dealing with this for a long time. What do you think of it? I don't know if I, st if I still feel something. I'm, I have a brain of iron. That's the way I've survived. That's the way I can speak to you in a so clear language. Is there a high price to be paid for that kind of brain of iron? Later on, perhaps? Later on, maybe. For the time being, so far, so good. Soon after the killing began, Gaillard decided he had to challenge the extremist government. Rwandan troops had stopped a Red Cross ambulance and killed six patients. I decided to call my headquarters in Geneva to tell the story. And my counterpart in Geneva told me, do you think we could make it public? And, and then you think twice, I mean, because if you make it public, then you know that people who might kill you would really decide to kill you because of what you told. Huh? And it was a bit poker. We, we decided to do it. So following day, BBC, Reuters, Radio France Internationale, it was everywhere. The publicity embarrassed the extremists and their government gave the Red Cross safe passage throughout Rwanda. So these six people didn't die for, for nothing. I mean, they, they, because of their deaths, hundreds of other people could be saved. Gaillard cultivated a relationship with the extremist leadership, which he believes helped the Red Cross save 65,000 lives. When, when we talk about mass saving, I think that's the best and the only way is to talk with the people who want to kill them. No? I remember one day I met, by chance, Colonel Theonest Bagosora. And I told him, Colonel, do something to, to stop the killings. I mean, this is... This is absurd, I mean, this... This... This is suicide, I mean. And his answer was... There, there are words you'll never forget, you know. His answer was, listen to sir, if I want, tomorrow I can recruit 50,000 more in Teramwe. So... I took him by the shirt. I'm 58 kilograms and must be 115. You know? I took him by his shirt, looked his eyes, and told him, Theonest, you will lose the war. Gaillard's network of aid workers across Rwanda gave him the most accurate count of the death toll. He estimated that in the first two weeks, 100,000 Rwandans had been killed. The Red Cross has a tradition of neutrality and public silence, but Gaillard decided that this genocide would be different. The International Committee of the Red Cross, which is a 140 years old organization, was not active during the Armenian genocide, shut up during the Holocaust. Everybody knew what was happening with the Jews. 